The African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and education. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Dr. Jeff Gaudier, the consulting psychologist for the well-known Harlem Dialect. Yes. Welcome to African American Legends. It's so great to be with you, Dr. Brown. Now, you haven't been around that long, but Harlem <laughs> Dialect has been around 175 years. That's which right. Is really remarkable. How did this organization start it, and what is its main contribution to the black community? Well, it was uh, an organization that was started by uh, two Quaker women who were very interested as to the misfortunes of young black children. Uh, many of them were orphans at the time. Uh, that's where they had gotten This is 1836. 1836, uh, the Colored uh, Orphan Asylum. And uh, what they wanted to do is get as many of their socialite friends, because these were very wealthy women. Which happens today, too. <laughs> which happens today, too. Uh, but probably back then, they were paying their fair share of taxes. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they were able to pull in all of the luminaries at the time to be able to establish uh, this uh, orphan, this asylum for young black children. And this was the first of its kind, uh, something that no one had ever done for young black children before. And of course, during the Civil War, the colored orphanage was burned down by some of the uh, people who had been recruited and didn't want to go to free the slaves, and they took it out on the orphanage. Fortunately, they were able to rebuild it and then they continue this long legacy that we see today. That's right, and as part of that legacy, they moved throughout uh, the city of New York. At one point, they were even in Riverdale. Uh, but now, as Harlem Dowling, uh, West Side Center, the main headquarters is actually on uh, 125th and 7th Avenue in the incredible Teresa Towers Hotel. And what a magnificent building. What a great place for Harlem uh, Dowling to be because it's part of the legend of that particular building. Now, what does Harlem Dowling actually do and how do they do it? Well, Harlem Dowling not only provides foster care services, uh, but they also provide... By foster care, you mean they facilitate families that want to adopt children? Yeah, let's, let, let's talk about that. What, what they actually do uh, is they have uh, many components, but what you're talking about is uh, the whole uh, idea of getting children to be adopted. That's secondary, mm -hmm. really, to what they do because we're really, really looking at foster care being the primary uh, mechanism uh, for what they're providing to the community. What they actually do is they go in to the African-American and Latino community in Harlem, Central Harlem, in Far Rockaway, in Queens, in other parts of the city, and they work with parents, biological parents, where the children have been removed due to neglect or abuse or some other unfortunate circumstance. They provide services to the biological parents to help them get over their drug abuse issues, learning parenting, and so on, but they work specifically with the children to be able to get them together, uh, to get through the traumas that they experience, to be able to go home to their biological parents. Now, if they are not, if the parents are not prepared, the children then are continue into foster care, or we actually work with adoptive parents to actually get them to be part of that home permanently. Now, your role as a psychologist it must be tremendous because you have to deal with both the parents and the kids and the staff. That's right. Now, what do you, what is your main role? Well, my main role as a psychologist with Harlem Dowling, a consulting psychologist, I'm part of what's known as uh, the treatment team uh, for children uh, who have uh, severe emotional issues. Now, my opinion is every foster care child has severe emotional issues because to be taken from your parents, whether they're abusive, neglected, uh, uh, neglective, using drugs, whatever the case may be, but to come out of that kind of situation, first to suffer the trauma of what happened with your biological parents and then to deal with the, with the grief, uh, with the anxiety, with the separation issues, I think is too much for any human being to have to bear. So as part of this enhanced treatment team, I along with social workers, caseworkers, a psychiatrist, a nurse, 
work with the kids to look at their comprehensive needs uh, in order to be able to have better mental health, to prepare them to return to their biological homes, stay in foster homes, or to be adopted. Okay, at some now point. how do you assess their needs? Well, what we do is uh, we do have a, a case conference uh, where we actually uh, bring the child's information to the table and discuss all of the different deficits, strengths, and so on that the child may have. And then we come up with a treatment plan uh, from the various disciplines to help that child. Plus, the children are evaluated both physically and emotionally, psychologically, to see what their issues may be and what we need to do with the biological parents. See, children who have in foster families have some of the same problems as people in intact families. How do you differentiate those situations? Well, that's a great question because quite often we may get foster parents who become frustrated and may too easily point to whatever difficulty the child may be having mm -hmm. as related to foster care, but in fact, it may just have to do with maturational issues, with teen rebellion issues, with children developing emotionally and physically different from other children. Uh, they don't always all reach that benchmark. So what we need to do is draw on our experiences as clinicians, as mental health workers, to be able to differentiate between what may be a foster care or potential adoptive issue versus just a regular issue that children have in this world. Uh, what are some of the markers for behavior problems that these kids might have? Give an example of some kind of behavior that a kid has that you want to intervene with. Well, uh, one of the primary ones that we see, uh, many of our children have an issue with anger. Mm -hmm. And that anger comes from, of course, they feel that they've been ripped away from a home where they were abused or neglected. And as we like to say... Do they know they were abused or neglected? Well, here's the situation. Be it ever terrible, there's no place like home. So even though they know they were abused or they may not know they were neglected as much as they should, they know that they still love that parent. And that's a very good thing. Um, especially because we know they will want to return. However, what we see is that either consciously or subconsciously, that anger manifests itself. It manifests itself uh, in school, against other children, against foster parents, sometimes against biological parents. So what we do, Dr. Brown, is we sit with them. We have the uh, dynamic uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, or we may institute some sort of a behavioral plan so that uh, we can uh, extinguish some of those uh, behaviors. But what we do is we pay attention and we listen to what it is that the child is saying regarding their anger and try to address that in every way possible, not just psychologically, but socially, physically. But if the child responds to you in a way that's hostile to you, how do you get over that? Well, it's, it's very interesting uh, that as psychotherapists, of course, we are trained to look at the issues of transference and counter-transference. Transference meaning um, the child sees you as father, as mother, as friend, as enemy, you are symbolic to that child because they're opening their heart to you. So if they are hostile to you as the therapist, I think that's progress mm -hmm. because what we're seeing is that they are manifesting something that gives you information as to who they are, how they see their own parents through you. So as a psychologist or a social worker, if you're saying, you know what, that child is too uh, hostile to me and I can't deal with it, then you don't need to be a therapist. You have to be in there. But what do you do to deal with that hostility to you? How well, do you deal with that? Well, what, what I do as a psychologist in working with children who can be hostile to me as the therapist is to question them as to where that hostility comes from. And then actually, as I get the information, I may do a role play. Do they know where it comes from? Many of them do figure it out at some point that it comes from the neglect or the abuse of the parents or the fact that their self-esteem is so low, they feel that everyone looks at them as being less than. So as they begin to understand where that comes from, then we can start, as I like to say, flip the script, trick the devil, and get them to find more appropriate ways to be able to handle that anger. The best way is to verbalize it knowing exactly what you're saying, where it's coming from, being able to speak it, and therefore that's the catharsis that makes them healthier. But suppose the uh, anger is coming from the system that they're in, 
What do you do? Take them out of the system or change the system? Well, I, I, I think, again, that, that's a fabulous question. We have to look at the system because the system does have warts. The system does always need to be improved. Because when we look at, for example, ACS, they go in, they remove a child. Quite often, and the record shows, they're doing it for the right reasons. But sometimes it becomes a numbers game. So once that child is removed, they can't give the child the attention that the child may need, or perhaps they're not able to communicate with the biological parents in a way that's as humanistic as it needs to be. So the biological parents get angry, the kids get angry. And as we know, when you are eaten up by the system, it certainly does make you feel like you are less than. But then, how do you act out? What do you do to move that acting out against the system into something positive? Well, what we look at, first of all, we have to address who we are because we're part of the system. And so we have to look at our attitudes. Uh, we have to look at the standards that we set for different people. We have to look at whatever prejudices we may have as an agency or as a treatment team. And we have to do that real soul searching to say, are we doing the best that we can for these children? As we begin to improve on the things that we do, and every case is different, every case we learn, every case we get better as administrators and treatment specialists, then we demonstrate to our children how to handle frustrations because we're more than just therapists and treatment people, we're also role models. Give an example of how you would demonstrate to a young person how to handle frustration. Okay, for example, if I come into the office on a particular day and I may have had a problem where I parked my car and I felt that I unjustly had gotten a ticket. Mm -hmm. And you know that can happen here yeah, uh, in absolutely. New York City. <laughs> right, so I may come up to the office, I may be frustrated, I may be a little bit angry, I may be irritable, but what I do is when the child says, Dr. Jeff, you don't seem like yourself today, and they will say that, mm -hmm. I will say, you know what? I really think I am angry or frustrated. I had gotten a ticket, I don't feel it was right, but I think what I'm gonna do is write some sort of a defense and see what I can do. So what I'm demonstrating there, Dr. Brown, is there is a way to very constructively work through your anger instead of saying, you know, when I see that, uh, that person, uh, uh, that DOT person who wrote that uh, ticket, you know, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. That is not the appropriate thing to do. And that's why, as treatment specialists, especially at Harlem Dowling, we try to be more than just specialists. We also try to be role models in every way possible because these children don't have enough role models. They have the foster parents to some extent, but more than anything else, they need people to be able to demonstrate to them how you deal with your anger constructively and that it's okay to be angry, but you have to as much as you can, and you can't be perfect, you have to communicate that anger in a way that is positive. So what are you doing with the community? These kids are sometimes pushing people on the sidewalk, impolite, and the community says, put them away. Don't, don't, don't let them bother me. How do you work with the community? Because that's a very important part of building uh, self-esteem. Absolutely, because they do exist in a community. You want to be able to take care of them so that they can do well in their homes, uh, whether foster, biological, adoptive, but hopefully back into those biological homes. That's where we want them to be. But what we well, find let is... let me ask this question. Are some biological homes just so difficult that kids shouldn't be there? We find that some of the people, some of, some of the biological parents, have such deep emotional, psychological issues that they're not ready to have children come back to them. And the reason that we work with the biological parents and don't make value judgments mm -hmm. is because it's the cycle, the generation mm -hmm. of dysfunction. It's not that these parents were born evil people. It's that they also came from dysfunctional parents, as their parents did. And we know that if you're talking about African-American parents, Latino parents, when you're dealing with issues of day-to-day -day racism, these people have been affected. When you're dealing with poverty, these people have been affected, and they just don't have the resources. But looking at the community, going back to your previous question, what we try to do, we don't see our kids acting out on the streets. Where we do see them acting out most often is in school. 
That's where they spend the majority of their times. And what we see is sometimes the teachers may get very, very upset with the kids, but we have an education specialist who will keep that communication going with that teacher so they become partners in working with that child and they're able to set up behavior modification programs, academic programs, so that the kids can do better in the schools. You use the term behavior modification. Yes. Now, give an example of how you modify behavior. Modifying behavior with behavior modification is simply looking at what the stimulus may be. What is that thing, that situation that gets you to respond to it? And so I like this idea of stimulus control. How do we pull that stimulus out so we can extinguish a behavior, a negative behavior, or how can we substitute a very positive stimulus that can get more of a positive behavior. But suppose the stimulus is having too many kids in the classroom. What can you do about that? Well, that's why we have timeouts. Just kidding. <laughs> but, um, and that's what we do see. But you need to understand, Dr. Brown, that many of our children, our foster care children, um, may not be in mainstream education. Some of those who do have some psychological issues or deeper psychological issues are in uh, very specific treatment programs, academic, um, uh, educational, psychological programs where we have a ratio of maybe two to one students to a teacher or three or four or five to one, but certainly not 30 or 40 or 50 to one as we see in some of our public schools. What are some of your successes? You've talked about the problem, you've talked about your approaches. Give an example of some of the successes of your work. Okay, well, I, I do believe that each child is a success. Uh, they're a success in progress because we know that they're going to make it. The fact that they are with us is a success. But that being said, very specifically, we have a number of children at Harlem Dowling who are now in college. To me, that is the ultimate success, that they are doing well in college. Many of them have scholarships. Uh, they do want to succeed. How'd you get them there? Well, we bribed many people. No, I'm just <laughs> joking. Um, working with them academically, our education specialist, um, even in therapy, where they may say things such as, you know what, I don't know if I really want to go to college. I respond to them the same way that I respond to my children. It's not a choice. <laughs> You're going. And they may say, well, other kids, they take a year off or two years off. And we say to them, you're not other kids. Mm -hmm. You have been at risk. You come from a background where many things were not given to you that you needed uh, in order to be more positive in your life, to be enriched socially and spiritually and psychologically. So you're going to college. And so we work with every child under the supposition that they must go to college and it becomes a mindset. Now, that being said, some of our kids do have some self-esteem issues, as we see with many foster care children, and they still may not want to go to college, but in the long run, they end up doing some community college. They get that two years in, and I'll take that over nothing. To what extent does the work that you and Holland Dowling do affect other agencies in your community? Well, I think what we do is we set a standard where we say this is the work that we're doing from our hearts. It's not about the money. Mm -hmm. We all don't make that much money for us to be in the business for the money. It's not a business. It's an avocation. Well, it's, how are you funded, by the way? Um, we're, it's, it's a not-for-profit. Uh, they have grants. Uh, but, of course, we depend on donations from everyone out there. And I, and I encourage people to please uh, donate to what we're doing. Yeah, you just recently had a, a function to raise money to celebrate the 175th anniversary, I understand that they honored you and a couple of the other staff members. Yes, they also uh, honored myself, uh, um, uh, Dr. James McKnight, our psychiatrist, Sherry McDowell, uh, a wonderful author in the community who runs uh, uh, sort of like a soup kitchen, if you will, at Harlem Dowling, where mm -hmm. she feeds thousands of people a week. Uh, it was a great success. Uh, and what's really wonderful is that there were many donations that were made, and almost my understanding is um, 90 cents out of every dollar goes back to our children. 
That's amazing because you see these not-for-profits yeah. out there and they're like, give, 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 donate, 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 and we see 10 cents out of every dollar going back to the cause and the rest going to administrative fees. So we really need people to go to um, our website and, and donate. Um, you also get a lot of public money, state money, federal money, city money. Some of that has decreased over time. Oh, absolutely, with very, the budget it's cuts. very important that that be continued. To what extent do you work with legislators to bring them aware, make them aware of what you're doing? Well, we're, we're very honored to have uh, many great legislators in the Harlem area, in the Queens area, who always look out for Harlem Dowling and certainly uh, try to find ways to give us more leads as to how to enrich the budget, how to get uh, uh, you know, certain grants done, and incredible grant writers. As a matter of fact, uh, one huge grant uh, that uh, we've been awarded is going to allow us to build another facility that we'll be moving into, uh, I believe, on 127th and Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, this facility will provide services not just to our children, but also to our wonderful veterans who need that help. They are so ignored. These people who have uh, enlisted or have been drafted and who fought for our country, who've been there for us in every way, even if they haven't gone to war. So we uh, have that facility there for them, and there will be a component of it that will also offer affordable housing to the community. Mm -hmm. So all of those grants, all of those things allow us to not just serve the children, but to serve the greater community, and to serve is one of the best things that anyone can ever do in yeah, life. This builds on the concept it takes a village to raise a child That's and right. a community. Uh, to what extent do you have recreation programs for the young people? Well, we do have after-school programs for them uh, where they can uh, get academic uh, tutoring and so on, uh, physical activities uh, that uh, they can engage in. Uh, certainly, again, we get involved with the schools to make sure that they're getting sports activities and so on. So we try to give a holistic uh, treatment approach to the many different things that do enrich children these days and kind of pulling them away from the computer that they love to live on and get addicted to all children and to get out there and be more physical. But the computer is a positive thing because it doesn't identify ideas and words and symbols. How do you integrate that into your work? Well, you have to find, you, you have to keep it well balanced. And we know that, of course, uh, computers have taken us to the next evolution. The internet has taken us to the next evolution uh, uh, as to who we are as human beings. But at the same time, too much of a good thing ain't that good. So what we talk with our kids about is when uh, they do uh, engage themselves on the computer to spend just a certain amount of time and not all day on it to get out there and not be so much into the virtual world but into the real world. And we do utilize computers, sitting with them at the computers to be able to do searches on schools and so on, not so much to playing games. What do you do in terms of developing the artistic potential? Because arts are a good way of moving people off of their own personal problems. What do you do at Harlem Dowling? What do you do in your work to involve these young people in the arts? Well, one of the things I like to do in my private practice is uh, encourage kids to draw as much as possible, uh, to freehand as much as possible. Uh, I know with Harlem Dowling, uh, one of the initiatives that I would like to push through, and I've spoken about this in the community before, is this whole idea of every child learning some sort of a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I prefer the piano only because, <laughs> yeah, I play the piano. Well, I don't play it that well, trust me. I, I played a tune for my teacher. I said, how did I do? Mm -hmm. He said, it was great. Great. Try it again, but this time take off your boxing gloves. Mm -hmm. But um, I encourage them to learn the piano because our kids love to write music, but they don't know how to read music. Mm -hmm. And every composition we know is much easier uh, written if you are able to play the piano. You know, Sarah Vaughan was an incredible musician, not just a singer. If she didn't like the way the tune was being played from a musician, she'd sit down and bang it out herself. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I try to tell our kids, listen, you guys are great singers, but are you real musicians? Mm -hmm. Learn to read music. Learn to play an instrument. So this way, when you get up on a bandstand and the musicians say, what key do you want to do it in? You don't say, ah, ah. No, you know the key of F or E minor or what have you, but E flat. But I think the important thing, and every study has shown, every child that learns an instrument 
has also been able to learn the sciences, to learn mathematics. There is a direct correlation. So if we can get our children to learn to play instruments, not just foster children, but all children, learn a language other than English, I think our kids will go much, much further, but that's what we want to do for our, our foster children. But of course, the Latino kids already have a language other than English. That's right. Well, that's right. But what's interesting is uh, some of our Latino children don't know how to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, they have this same issue that I had as a Haitian child. My parents are both, uh, were both Haitian that I see with other kids. They get embarrassed about speaking yeah. their native language mm -hmm. in front of other kids. And so they grow up not learning Spanish. Uh, so I try to encourage them, learn your native language. And if you don't have a second language, certainly try to learn one. Oh. When you have these sessions with these young people, how long does the session actually take? Well, it, it's, it's interesting that uh, in my private practice, our sessions are 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're working in foster care, they can be 30 minutes, they can be 45 minutes, they can be an hour and a half. At times, they can be 10 minutes because that child is just breezing through. They don't have an appointment. I'm like, come here, you. Mm -hmm. And I grab them pull them into the office, sit down, do a very intense uh, intervention. You know, they can't wait to get out of there or they have another appointment. We let them go, but then we bring them back for a longer session. So really, it's catcher's catch can. Well, we have to have you back again. Uh, we've been talking with Dr. Jeff Gaudier, consulting psychologist for Harlem Dowling, and we talk about some of the problems that our young people face and how they can be dealt with. Thanks again for being with us today, Jeff. It, it is my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Brown.